so we're going to work through a couple cases. I'll then talk through the epidemiology, the pathogenesis, and then primary prevention therapies for sudden cardiac death after myocardial infarction. We'll close with one last case and some take-home points. So the first case starts at an outreach visit. Uh, we're seeing someone in the western suburbs or west of the western suburbs. It's a young woman who complains of palpitations. Before the visit, we find this ECG in the chart, and we see that this is her baseline. And she tells us that over the course of the last year, she's been to the emergency room three times for palpitations that have not resolved after an hour of waiting. She's had other episodes, but they resolve, and those don't bring her in. Each time, she gets adenosine and converts back to sinus rhythm. At the close of the visit, uh, we come to the conclusion that she probably has a paroxysmal SVT and it's likely AVNRT. Uh, she's going to start some metoprolol, and then she's going to be referred to EP for consideration of ablation given the frequency of the emergency room visits. Less than 48 hours later, she's seen back in the Hutchinson emergency room with the same tachyarrhythmia. She gets adenosine and converts to this rhythm. This time around, the emergency room doctor checks the troponin, and it's rather elevated. She says that maybe she had some chest pressure during the palpitations, but she's totally asymptomatic now. So the emergency room provider calls the on-call cardiologist at Abbott, and they come up with this plan at the time of the phone call. She has this recurrent SVT and likely a type 2 myocardial infarction, although we can't rule out plaque rupture. She should be transferred to Abbott for echocardiogram, a CTA to rule out coronary disease, and to see EP. And also, in walking through the review of systems with the patient in the emergency room, what wasn't picked up by the cardiologist was that she's recently been worked up by a rheumatologist for Wegner's uh, or polyangiitis with granulomatosis. She's had recurrent ear infections. She's had some sinus problems and some muscle aches. And so she has this working diagnosis of Wegner's on the side. So here's her echocardiogram. It's just a single shot, uh, trying to be representative. I'm sorry it's not playing well. But what we saw there was that her LV systolic function is not normal. Her EF is on the order of 40%. She had a little bit of a distal lateral wall motion abnormality. And so rather than undergoing a coronary CTA, uh, the next morning she gets an invasive angiogram. And I'll show you some stills on the next slide. Um, she has an occluded OM, and she has a very small, uh, thin distal LAD that doesn't reach the apex. So at the conclusion of the case, the proceduralist thinks that this is you know, one of a few things. This could be SCAD, okay, given the demographic. This could be plaque rupture. Uh, or this could be some kind of vasculitis in the context of this working diagnosis of Wegner's. So because the lesions are very distal, there's no intervention that's taken, she's pain-free. She gets a cardiac MRI, and I'm sorry it's not playing well, it's just a representative shot, but we again see that, L, uh, excuse me, that LA, we see some LAD distribution, wall motion abnormality at the apex, and we see that the OM distribution is also akinetic, uh, the distal lateral wall. With perfusion imaging, uh, we confirm that the wall motion abnormalities correspond to infarct. So the LAD, we have infarct at the apex on the left, and then in the OM distribution, we have infarct with MVO uh, in the lateral or anterior lateral wall, consistent with a recent event. And that probably explains her elevated troponin. So she has somewhat of a busy hospitalization. Uh, she's seen by rheumatology. They're able to confirm that based on serology, she does have Wegner's. She's set up for a biopsy. She started on steroids, and she's also started on rituxan. She's seen by the heart failure service. Uh, she started on appropriate guideline-directed medical therapy. And she's seen by EP because this all started with the SVT. And they decide that given all that's going on, it makes the most sense to defer ablation until her rheumatologic condition is better controlled. So it's a rather long hospitalization, total of eight days. She goes home with the diagnosis up top, end stemming due to scatter vasculitis, this mixed ischemic, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, and the paroxysmal SVT. She's going to leave on the medications listed. She's going to be seen in one week to further uptritrate those meds. So she's at home with family, and a couple days later, they hear a thud in the bedroom. They run in, find that she's unresponsive, start CPR, call 911. The first to arrive are police. They attach an AED, which advises shock, 
she gets more CPR and EMS arrive. By the time they arrive, she does in fact have a pulse. She's unresponsive, so she gets a temporary airway and she's brought to Abbott Northwestern. Here's her initial ECG in the emergency room. Um, she, she has frequent ectopy, uh, certainly no ST elevation uh, on the native QRSs. She does have some polymorphic BT in the ICU shortly after arrival, but nothing that's sustained and nothing that requires treatment. And so she receives therapeutic hypothermia uh, because she was unresponsive after the arrest. Uh, fortunately, uh, after rewarming, she has recovery of her neurocognitive function uh, and is able to rehab in the hospital. She's seen by EP. She gets a secondary prevention device because now she's had an arrest. She's seen by heart failure and small changes are made to her medications. And she ultimately discharges to Courage Kenny uh, after about a week's worth of time. So I'd ask the group to consider, is there anything that we could have done during that first hospitalization to have prevented this near fatal cardiac arrest within days of her leaving the hospital? And we'll come back to this. The second case is a little bit more straightforward clinically. We're called to see a 58-year-old female. This is at Hennepin for cath lab activation. She's had two days of chest pain, and this isn't subtle. She has rather impressive ST elevation in her anterolateral leads, and she's also developing Q waves in that distribution, which goes along with the fact that she's been having symptoms for about two days. So she goes to the cath lab emergently overnight, and I'll give you stills here in a second, but here uh, there is no LAD, and here there is an LAD after reperfusion. So again, no vessel, vessel. She gets an echocardiogram that shows that her EF is low, and she has a pretty dense LED distribution wall motion abnormality with contrast. And it's recommended that she get another study in a few days to assess for LV thrombus, which we can see in these patients. And at first glance, we don't see one. But then with some inferior angulation, we start to see a clot up at the top of the screen at the apex of the heart. So she's in the hospital a little longer than average for a straightforward STEMI because of the combination of the LV dysfunction and the clot, uh, but ultimately preps for discharge to home. She had an anterior STEMI. She now has a new ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF on the order of probably 35, 40%, and she has an LV thrombus. So she's gonna leave the hospital on a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, uh, uh, aldosterone receptor antagonist, and a statin. She's going to be on short-term triple therapy, which we were doing for about a month at the time. And then she's going to return to cardiology clinic in just one week, one near-term follow-up for up titration of the heart failure meds. So she's at home, and two, three days later, her and her husband are watching TV, getting ready for bed. He gets up to go brush his teeth and comes back to find her with agonal respirations and unresponsive. So he immediately starts CPR. He calls 911. First to arrive this time are fire. They attach an AED, which advises shock. So she receives a shock. She gets another round, followed by another shock that's advised by the AED. And then EMS arrive and find that she has a pulse. And so they are able to transport her to Hennepin. Uh, en route, she awakens, starts to stir. She becomes agitated and ultimately requires sedation so that we can get an EKG. Here we see that she's in sinus. Uh, she has further development of those Q waves in that anterolateral distribution on the far right of the screen. And her ST elevations are actually improved compared to prior. I didn't show you the EKG she got prior to discharge, but we know that this is certainly no worse than the one she had just before she left the hospital. Nonetheless, she goes emergently for coronary angiography, and we can see that the LAD stent is open. Uh, she gets an echo, which looks maybe slightly improved compared to the one prior that showed the clot. The clot was interestingly not seen on this study. Uh, she does not require therapeutic hypothermia because she was awakening. Uh, just got some sedation to get the EKG. Her course is not particularly complicated. Over the course of three days, uh, she rehabs with inpatient therapy. She's seen by EP, gets a secondary prevention device, uh, and then ultimately discharges home. So again, to consider, is there anything we could have done during the first hospitalization to have prevented this near fatal sudden cardiac arrest at home? And these two cases, they were part of my first year's worth of training, and they stuck with me because, one, they were at the two different hospitals. Uh, they occurred within a month of one another. And it's not so often that we're taking care of someone and 
well, let's say we see on the order of 20 patients on a service on any given day and we discharge five of them maybe, or at least sign off on them and we have follow-up arranged, and we just assume that they're gonna be seen in clinic in a few days and continue their course as outpatients. But in this case, these women were both rather young, 41 and 58, nearly died. And there was a chance that they wouldn't necessarily come back to my service and I would never hear about it because they could have passed away or based on proximity or ambulance, they could have been routed to another hospital and I wouldn't have heard anything about it. And there's, I think there's certain services in the hospital like heart failure, for instance, that have particular continuity with patients and hear about these adverse events more frequently. But in this case, uh, it was kind of alarming to me. So we're gonna talk through sudden cardiac death. We're gonna talk about its epidemiology and pathogenesis. And then we'll talk about the pharmacologic and device therapies for prevention of early sudden cardiac death after myocardial infarction. So first, for the definition of epidemiology, uh, it's interesting, the way in which I, and I think many use sudden cardiac death in clinical practice, uh, what we're trying to infer or um, convey is uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmia, which isn't necessarily the way that ACC defines the condition. They define it as sudden or unexpected death occurring within an hour of the onset of symptoms or occurring in patients found dead within 24 hours of being asymptomatic and presumably due to a cardiac arrhythmia or a hemodynamic catastrophe. And I think the important add is hemodynamic catastrophe, which could include things like massive MI, massive PE, uh, potentially myocardial rupture or aortic rupture, which aren't necessarily conveyed when we say sudden cardiac arrest or sudden cardiac death uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the clinical setting. So as for the epidemiology, uh, if we contrast the absolute number of events versus the incidence of events in various populations, and we're focusing primarily on ventricular arrhythmias here, uh, we see that the, uh, in the blue box, uh, the general population, they have uh, the highest number of absolute sudden cardiac death events. However, because the denominator is so big, the incidence is rather small. So these are not the patients who want to target with therapies, okay, because we're not going to be very effective or efficient. Whereas the high risk groups in the red, uh, they have a smaller absolute number of cardiac arrests or sudden cardiac death events, but the incidence is very high because the numerator, excuse me, because the denominator is smaller. And these are the patients that we're targeting with our therapies. Those with low EF, those that have previously survived a cardiac arrest, or those that have had big MIs. So we can look at this in another way, and we see that uh, sudden cardiac death is largely attributed to coronary artery disease, uh, making up three quarters of the patients. The remaining quarter is attributed to valve disease, non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, and other uh, heart disease as listed there. And when we talk about uh, ventricular arrhythmias in the context of ischemic heart disease, it's really about a trigger and the substrate. And so the substrate is the edema or the scar, depending on the temporal relationship with the myocardial infarction. So early on, you have edema, and then you go on to develop scar. And then there's abnormalities in conduction, repolarization, and autonomic modulation uh, that serve as the trigger and lead to your ventricular arrhythmia. And again, I won't go into the detail of these things. Uh, they're, you know, well outside my expertise, but know that depending on the temporal relationship with the event, uh, they're gonna occur with more or less frequency. And together, uh, you get your ventricular arrhythmia. So the best time-dependent analysis of this, looking at sudden cardiac death after myocardial infarction was a sub-study of Valiant. And Valiant was a big study in the early 2000s, looking at ACE inhibitors and ARBs early after myocardial infarction in patients who had a low EF. And what they found when looking specifically at sudden cardiac death in this cohort was that 7% of patients had an event within three years of their MI. And the highest rate of sudden cardiac death was early after the event. And this decreased exponentially over time. So within the first 30 days, there was a mean 1.4% chance of sudden cardiac death. And then over two years, they finally hit a steady state. And so if you take a 30-day period at the two-year mark, you see that the rate of sudden cardiac death is about 0.14% over a month a tenfold decrease. They were able to identify some associations or some predictors. The lower your EF, the higher the chance you're gonna have sudden cardiac death. Uh, and this certainly holds true even to the lowest EF, although once your EF starts to drop below 20%, most of those patients are dying of pump failure or heart failure, which tends to dilute uh, 
sudden cardiac death is a cause of death within an all-cause mortality bucket. Uh, additional predictors of sudden cardiac death in this cohort, uh, as well as others, have been old age, higher heart rate, beta blocker intolerance, prolonged QRS, abnormal heart rate variability, non-sustained BT, uh, sustained BT uh, induced on EP study, and late potential on signal average ECG. And this data has been replicated in many other studies. Uh, I'll highlight one study that's somewhat close to home. Regional authors looked at Olmsted County in southern Minnesota uh, and tracking about 3,000 patients who had a large myocardial infarction. They found that the risk of sudden cardiac death within the first 30 days was 1.2%, so very similar to that 1.4% in Valiant. And they hit a steady state to 0.12 after about a year. So again, very similar numbers. But when you talk about sudden cardiac death, um, and the more you read about it, it's a little bit of a gray and messy diagnosis retrospectively. Uh, there's been some autopsy studies that have shed some light on the fact that maybe all the patients that were calling sudden cardiac death uh, didn't in fact die of sudden cardiac death due to ventricular arrhythmias, but rather there were alternative causes. And one such study was another substudy of Valiant, uh, and I found this pretty interesting. So, what the graph shows is uh, the black bar is cause of death based on clinical adjudication, so chart review and discussion with providers. The gray bar is cause of death based on autopsy, and the white bar is cause of death when you have both informations combined. So only 15% of patients who died underwent autopsy, which uh, you know, alerts you to the chance of certainly some bias or confounders. But we see that of those patients that were uh, deemed sudden death due to ventricular arrhythmia, 42% uh, of them were reclassified when we had autopsy data. And those reclassifications were in the form of recurrent MI, cardiac rupture, and pump failure. And similarly, Optimal was another large study looking at ACE inhibitors and beta blockers in patients who had a big MI and a low EF. Uh, a portion of the patients underwent autopsy. And very similar findings here. Many of the patients who were believed to have died of ventricular arrhythmias were actually reclassified, in this case, uh, almost entirely to acute MI. But as you think through it, you can see that someone may have had an MI that could then lead to a ventricular arrhythmia, or someone could have developed heart failure, which could have led to a ventricular arrhythmia. So there's certainly going to be some overlap, and it's still gray. The way we make the diagnosis of Sudden cardiac death on autopsy is through a diagnosis of exclusion. We look for MI characterized by a fresh plaque in a coronary. We look for PE. We look for stroke, whether it be clot in, in the cerebrovasculature or blood in the brain. Uh, we look for rupture, which I think is pretty self-evident or obvious. And then uh, pump failure or heart failure is diagnosed simply by uh, pulmonary edema at the time of autopsy. And if none are present, then we're left with sudden cardiac death. So we'll talk a little bit about the medications we have available uh, to help prevent this circumstance. Beta blockers were studied, uh, in, published in 2005 was Capricorn. Uh, many trials have shared features and found similar findings. But the, the big points are on the left, we saw a decrease in all-cause mortality, and on the right, we saw a decrease in sudden cardiac death with beta blockers in patients who had a low EF when they were prescribed the drug early after their myocardial infarction. So they generally get a thumbs up. Uh, although we learned from Comet, another beta blocker study, that beta blockers are not for everyone. We need to discriminate who we give them to uh, because some patients are more fragile than others and we can precipitate heart failure. So I think when used judiciously uh, with safety in mind can definitely lead to these outcomes, a decrease in sudden death and a decrease in all-cause mortality. ACE inhibitors have been studied over and over again. Uh, TRACE was a large style in the trial in the mid-90s as well as SAVE, uh, but again showed a decrease in all-cause mortality on the left and sudden cardiac death on the right. So thumbs up for ACE inhibitors. ARBs uh, have not been studied against placebo, but have been studied against ACE inhibitors, which were uh, the gold standard at the time and showed no difference in all-cause mortality and no difference in sudden cardiac death. So we can extrapolate that they have uh, the same benefit. Give them a thumbs up. Aldosterone receptor antagonists. So studied was a plerinone in Ephesus, uh, published in 2005, and this is kind of interesting. So a plerinone was prescribed really earlier, earlier than many of the other trial meds, within three days uh, with 
trial closed at 14 days, or enrollment closed at 14 days after the event in patients who had a low EF. And again, what we see is we decrease sudden cardiac death and we decrease all-cause mortality, but the difference here is that these graphs only go out 30 days. So within 30 days of starting the med, we were able to demonstrate a statistically significant reduction in sudden cardiac death and all-cause mortality with a plurinone. So definitely a thumbs up, but it's interesting because I think in clinical practice, this is the one that we're really late to add. You know, we start to approach this idea of polypharmacy, these patients, like maybe that first, the second woman I showed you, you know, she came in on nearly no medications, and then we have to add an aspirin, a statin, we have to add warfarin, and a NACE inhibitor, and a beta blocker, and we say, well, call up in clinic, consider starting aldactone in clinic, because we just feel like we've started too many medications, we've done too much, but this <coughs> is a medication that's been studied and has been proven to very quickly reduce your chance of sudden death and all-cause mortality. Yeah. So is this on the background of everyone getting a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So amiodarone, uh, published in 97, was EMIAT, uh, certainly before uh, the time I was practicing, but uh, showed a decrease in sudden cardiac death, but had neutral impact on all-cause mortality or survival. Okay, so we're preventing ventricular arrhythmias, but patients are dying more of something else with amiodarone. So it has not been adopted into widespread clinical use. You could argue that maybe uh, reasonable for certain select patients, uh, but for the most part, we don't see a lot of this used for primary prevention. So we'll give it a neutral thumbs. Uh, Sotolol, studied in SWORD, it was harmful, uh, very rarely used for primary prevention. I think can be used certainly in secondary prevention under special circumstances, but in patients who have a low EF and are early after myocardial infarction, we don't use Sotolol routinely. Class 1C agents, uh, such as fleconide, were studied in CAST. Again, in patients who had a myocardial infarction, low EF, it was also harmful, uh, so we don't use fleconide routinely. When we summarize the medications that we have available, again, we have beta blockers, we have ACE inhibitors or ARBs, and we have aldosterone receptor antagonists that are all going to decrease sudden cardiac death as well as decrease all-cause mortality following a myocardial infarction. We touched on how amiodarone will decrease sudden cardiac death, but has a neutral impact on all-cause mortality. So now let's transition to device therapy. Uh, and so I think in order to understand where we are currently with uh, newer therapies and CMS payment schemes for when we can put in a device, we have to first go through some historical data. And so uh, MADIT-1 was published in 96. This was looking at putting a device in patients who had an ischemic cardiomyopathy, not necessarily with a recent myocardial infarction. And what we saw here was that those that got a device lived longer than those that didn't get a device. MUST had rather similar entry criteria, an ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF slightly higher at 40%. You had to have non-sustained VT and a positive EP study. Again, reduction in all-cause mortality with the device. And then finally, MADIT uh, dropped the EF to 30% and got rid of the non-sustained VT in the EP study requirement for entry, and again showed that we were able uh, to reduce mortality with an ICD. But these trials don't necessarily apply to the patients that I presented at the beginning of the, the talk, because as we see on the far right here, MADIT on top, required you to be three weeks out from an MI, two months out from CAB, or three months out from PCI. And then on the bottom, MADIT-2 required you to be a month out from myocardial infarction and three months out from any kind of revascularization. In the middle is MUST, uh, which although it didn't require you to wait any given time after myocardial infarction, 85% of patients were more than 30 days out from their MI at the time of enrollment, and more than 50% uh, were more than three years out. So these were, for the most part, more stable ischemic cardiomyopathies in these trials. And so that brings us to the trial data for early post-myocardial infarction, sudden cardiac arrest, device primary prevention. Two trials we'll look at. Uh, the first was Dynamit. And again, uh, Dynamit was able to show that if we put a device in early, so within 40 days of an MI in patients who have a low EF, who have abnormal heart rate variability as a predictor of ventricular arrhythmia, so trying to target a patient population that was gonna have events, reduce sudden cardiac death, uh, 
but had a neutral impact on all-cause mortality at three years. Okay, so they were preventing ventricular arrhythmia as the patients were dying of something else in the device arm to make up for it. This study was almost identically, uh, was repeated more or less a few years later in IRIS, taking patients five to 31 days after their MI with a low EF and non-sustained VT and an elevated resting heart rate, again, trying to pick out predictors of ventricular arrhythmias and come up with a patient population that was gonna have a high rate uh, of events. This graph is almost identical to the one on the prior screen. We're able to decrease sudden cardiac death early. Uh, however, again, neutral impact on all-cause mortality. And so there's two theories uh, that explain why this is. One is that uh, the competing cause of death theory, so less than half of the deaths are due to sudden cardiac death. And that's the only kind of death that the device is going to help, right? So those that are dying of heart failure, we can't influence it. The second theory is that uh, the device somehow may be harmful because, again, we're preventing ventricular arrhythmias uh, as a cause of death. We're not impacting all-cause mortality. And we know from the trials that implant deaths are exceptionally rare, okay, so it's not that. There's theories that the RV pacing shocks, whether appropriate or inappropriate, can be harmful. Uh, you're certainly at a risk of endocarditis or other late complications with the device. And then some, uh, as I read, explain that there's theory, potentially the defibrillatory threshold testing that was done routinely at the time can be particularly harmful to the recently infarcted myocardium. Um, so whatever it is, we didn't come up with data uh, through either of these trials to justify putting a device in early after myocardial infarction. And that leads us to the current guidelines this is the algorithm from the 2017 uh, ACC ventricular arrhythmia guideline. And we have the primary prevention uh, of sudden cardiac death algorithm for patients who have ischemic heart disease. We see that if you have ischemic heart disease and you have a low EF, and you've had an MI within 40 days, or you've been revascularized within 90 days, first up is goal-directed medical therapy in green. We'll come back to the orange box, which is the wearable cardioverter defibrillator. And then I found it interesting that on top, uh, there's a class one recommendation to consider an EP study in the context of non-sustained VT. And if able to induce VT, you can consider an ICD early. And this data uh, comes from, and what's cited here is MUST. But as I stated, MUST, it was only 15% of the patients that were within 30 days of their MI. Um, and the trials also criticized because as low as 30% of patients or on beta blockers at the time of the study. So for the most part, even though there's a green box up there, I haven't seen this adopted in clinical practice, uh, and it's not commonplace here. And as far as where we get these cutoffs, so Dynamit, which was a negative study, enrolled patients six to 40 days after their MI. Because it was a negative study, we have to wait 40 days to put in a device. MADIT 2, which was a positive study, enrolled patients 90 days after revascularization. And that's why we're waiting 90 days if you've been revascularized. Which leads us to CMS coverage. So uh, what the small red text more or less says from the CMS website is that if you've had a myocardial infarction and you have a low EF, you get an ICD unless you've had your MI within 40 days, you've been revascularized within 90 days, you have class four heart failure, uh, or you're a revascularization candidate, in which case we should revascularize you, see if your EF recovers, and you may no longer need or qualify for an ICD. Which brings us to the orange box, the wearable cardioverter defibrillator. This is the life vest. Uh, many of us know the wearable cardioverter just simply as the life vest. It's the branded Zoll product. It's kind of like what Kleenex is to tissue. We just say life vest. Uh, but it's, it's uh, patients wear it. Uh, as you see, it has four uh, non-adhesive electrodes that uh, go around the abdomen or thorax. It then has three defibrillatory pads, two on the back, one on the front. Uh, you wear a, the holster or the box on your belt, which is going to detect and interpret arrhythmias or whatever is on your ECG. And the way it works is when it senses a ventricular arrhythmia, it's going to do a couple things. The first thing it's going to do, it's going to send out an alert, which is both tactile and audible. So the patient has a chance, if they're feeling well, to abort a shock. Because presumably if they're feeling well, they're not in VT or VF. The other thing it's going to do, it's going to release some gel 
uh, at the site of the pads, which will increase conductance and decrease skin burns prior to getting a shock. Uh, it cannot pace, and so it cannot deliver ATP, just like a subcutaneous ICD, uh, but it can be effective uh, at aborting a ventricular arrhythmia, as I'll show you. It was approved in, two, let's see here, 2004, a uh, very small trial, well, 300 patients wore the device. They were all at high risk of shock. Uh, it delivered six appropriate shocks, two unsuccessful shocks, uh, and six inappropriate shocks, and based on that limited data, it won FDA approval. So then, uh, nearly a decade later, that was 2004, in 2013, registry data was published uh, looking at patients similar to those that I presented at the beginning uh, of the talk. And they found that when the device was worn, 1.6% received appropriate shocks, mostly within 90 days. 1.2% received appropriate shocks within 30 days of their MI. And that 1.2% is the exact same number as the observed rate of sudden cardiac death in the Olmsted County cohort. 1.1% received inappropriate shocks. And if you got a shock, 91% of you went on to survive to the emergency room and received on average two shocks to abort your arrhythmia. And then a few years later, probably because of payer pressure, there was a randomized controlled trial uh, known as VEST, looking at the wearable cardio defibrillator in high-risk patients after their MI. So these are the patients that I presented more or less at the beginning of the talk. Recent infarct, low EF, and within seven days, a discharge from the hospital. And interestingly, uh, in fact, hard to explain, what we found was that there was no statistical impact on sudden death, but there was a statistical impact on all-cause mortality, which is pretty hard to rectify. It's the exact opposite, really, of amiodarone, opposite of dynamite and iris. Somehow the vest was decreasing all-cause mortality, but not having a statistical effect on sudden cardiac death. And uh, you know, it can't be explained. Uh, I, I won't be able to explain it. When we look at the arrhythmic deaths, we see that there were 25 in the, in the vest arm, okay? Only nine patients who died of arrhythmia were wearing the vest at the time of death. So, so there was no chance that those other 16 would be helped. When we look at all-cause mortality, uh, we see 4.9 versus 3.1%, so 1.8 absolute risk reduction in all-cause mortality within 90 days, not a very long trial. So that's, those are outstanding numbers. Um, again, really difficult to explain. Other interesting points, so 1.4% of patients received an appropriate shock. 100% uh, of patients who had a ventricular arrhythmia were converted, but only 70% went on to survive the event because 30% developed some kind of bradyarrhythmia or asystole. Another 5% died uh, after the event, so maybe they made it to the emergency room after converting from VT or VF, but they went on to die. There was a 0.6% rate of inappropriate shocks, but 4.5% of patients had to abort a shock. So you're going to abort three shocks for every successful shock that you get. The manufacturer was happy. Uh, this is their press release at the time. So relative risk reduction, 36%, uh, all-cause mortality. And again, currently in the guidelines, it's a class 2B recommendation. A trial was published after these guidelines. Uh, but uh, the wording here is that it may be reasonable prescribe a wearable cardioverter defibrillator for specific populations. Those that are awaiting transplant, those that have an EF of 35% or less and are within 40 days of an MI or have a newly diagnosed non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, those that have been revascularized within 90 days, I don't normally think of this, but those that have myocarditis or those that have a secondary cardiomyopathy or a systemic infection that would <laughs> prevent them from receiving an implantable device. So that's most of the content. We'll close with one more case. Uh, this was from last year, again, at Hennepin, as is often the case uh, if anything happens to someone while they're at US Bank Stadium, they're just brought across the street to the Hennepin Emergency Room. It's very close. Nice gentleman was in town rooting for Texas Tech uh, up from Texas. They were playing Michigan State in the first round. And him and his wife were leaving the stadium, walking. He felt palpitations, looked down at his Apple Watch, saw that his heart rate was 180, and then collapsed. And he reigned, regained consciousness within a matter of seconds and knew where he was. And I met him the day after he'd been admitted. He had a history of hypertension and diabetes. 
and he told us that he's had one similar episode of palpitations some weeks prior uh, that spontaneously resolved. He felt lightheaded but didn't collapse. He'd had one beer at the game uh, but hadn't been drinking heavily. Uh, he had traveled the day before, so he was maybe a little bit dehydrated yet, um, but it was a pretty concerning story. He had this initial ECG, uh, which I think is overall pretty benign. Uh, I don't know if we can quite call those Q waves in the inferior leads. We get some more information. His troponin was checked and trended. It rose uh, to 1.1 and then started to come down. And we got an echocardiogram, which uh, just a couple representative shots, take my word for it, was pretty normal. Uh, there wasn't much to be seen. Because of his elevated troponin, uh, he had an angiogram, and I'm going to give you stills because I was afraid this wouldn't play well. Uh, what we saw here was that uh, he had some disease. So he had an occluded uh, high OM or ramus on the left, and then on the right we see he had severe disease in his proximal LED and his distal LED, and then out in a, a fair sized diagonal. So after taking diagnostic images, the case was stopped, and he was introduced to a surgeon and offered the concept of surgery, given the fact that he had diabetes. And he said that uh, you know, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do, but he thought he wanted to have surgery, and he wanted to go back to Texas to make up his mind, because he wanted to be near home should he want surgery. He wanted to meet the surgeon in Texas before he committed to it. And he said, there's no way I could have surgery here, because I don't want my wife staying in a hotel for a week. There's a chance I'd have to go to rehab, and I'd be out of state for rehab. And then on the far end of things, I'd be having to travel across the country after a major operation just to get home. We said, well, you know, we're pretty concerned about what happened because you collapsed, and we're, this was likely a ventricular arrhythmia. I mean, your heart rate was 180, and uh, you certainly have the substrate to explain it. Uh, but we ultimately decided to send him home. He had called a cardiologist down in Texas and set up an appointment for two days out. He had a flight the day after discharge. So he was going to leave with multivessel coronary disease. He was going to leave with high risk syncope and hypertension and diabetes. Uh, he was going to go on a statin, a beta blocker, and an ARB. He was going to leave with a wearable cardioverter defibrillator. Because he didn't fall into the criteria in the guidelines or by CMS, he was going to have to pay for it out of pocket. The way you access them out of pocket is you pay something on the order of $1,800 per month rental. Okay? So he, he committed to paying for that. As we explained what the circumstance was and what our concerns were, he agreed that he wanted to pay for it out of pocket, and he, he had the means. He was a small business owner. And then he was going to see a cardiologist a couple days later. Uh, down in Texas, we had all the discs ready. And so we left. And you would not remember this, but there were a lot of snowstorms in February last year. And so there was a big storm that night, and he was going to fly out the next day. So we called him over the lunch hour and just say, hey, did you get out OK? How are you doing? He says, no, I'm stuck in the hotel here in Minneapolis, but I got a flight this evening to get out. He said, OK, that's good. So you'll still make the appointment. Yeah, I'll still make the appointment. Are you wearing the vest? He says, no, I'm watching TV in bed. I got it right next to me. So if I feel anything, <laughs> I'm going to put it on. So despite paying out of pocket for it, you see, you really have to participate. <laughs> so uh, in summary, sudden cardiac death, it's a messy clinical endpoint without autopsy. And even then, it can be a little bit gray. The vast majority of sudden cardiac death is attributed to ischemic heart disease, as I showed. The risk of sudden cardiac death is highest in the first month after the myocardial infarction. We can prescribe beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and uh, aldosterone receptor antagonists, which again, I encourage you to prescribe during the hospital stay or prior to discharge. They have the best evidence for preventing sudden cardiac death after an MI. And ICDs are mostly inaccessible early after an MI. We talked about that uh, small avenue to get an ICD through the MUST protocol, but we don't do a lot of that in clinical practice. You have to participate in order to benefit from the wearable cardiac defibrillator, uh, both our patient as well as the patients in the trial. Uh, again, many of them that died of ventricular arrhythmias or presumed ventricular arrhythmias were not wearing the device when they died. Its data is a little bit cloudy. We can't explain why there was a decrease in all-cause mortality but no impact on sudden cardiac death. It can successfully abort ventricular arrhythmias, but that in itself does not ensure you survive. 30% of patients die shortly thereafter. You're at risk of inappropriate shocks, and it currently holds a 2B recommendation in the guidelines. Thank you.
Yeah. So, um, great. I wanted to know, you talked a couple of times about the Can you talk more about that? Was it, was so it there was very little variability? Yes. Yeah, so I think there are multiple um, predictors all getting at underlying uh, autonomic tone dysregulation, and that was one of them, um, as was increased heart rate, for instance, uh, and really, a, to an extreme, non-sustained BT, uh, but all more or less trying to get to the same point. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Rob. <clears throat> so has someone categorized all those other types of deaths to see if there's some clue of why the non-sudden cardiac deaths go up in the defibrillator groups? I mean, were they pneumonias? Were, what, what were they? Yeah, I mean, it, was an, it was a graphic. Um, uh, to a point that you can't, it, it's kind of that as much that a mix of the competing cause of death, so patients are dying of something unrelated to the device itself, uh, as well as they are getting endocarditis. Um, they're developing more heart failure with the device than the group that doesn't have a device, suggesting that maybe the RV pacing uh, is contributing to heart failure. But it's, um, it's, there's not enough of a signal, from what I understand, to point one particular direction. Yeah. A great overview. Did you come across any data on the use of MIBG scanning to risk stratify? I didn't, or what little I did, I didn't dig into. And I don't know the literature well, but I know that's another area where people are looking at sort of whether nuclear scanning can give you some sense of, I don't know if this is the right even way to describe it, sympathetic tone or sympathetic level of innervation may have some impact on this, um, but it, it seems to remain very niche experimental. Yeah. Can't speak to it, sorry. Neither can I. <laughs> that's why I asked. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for coming in.